There's a new kid in town who is dominating, and boy, do we all want a piece of that winning energy. The Bamboo Lab X1 carbon printer here is the new quintessential model of a best 3D printer, which is awesome in one regard and not so great in another regard because you see a winning model defines what a printer looks like and that means that all of the copycats and clones going forward are going to look like this and we won't get a whole lot of diversity and diversity is necessary in any ecosystem this is not the only way to make a 3d printer it might still be the winning 3d printer for years to come we might see it in model shops professional uh, prototyping shops across the world for all of the coming years i don't know it could totally win but we need the diversity and we don't get it when the representativeness heuristic, which is what the psychologists call it, when that causes all of us to have this in mind when we think of a 3D printer, it's not good. And it's been not good for many years because Prusa here has defined a winning 3D printer for quite some time. This bed slinger with the inertial mass of the bed moving back and forth is not ideal. And there was a year probably where this really was the best printer on the market, but that's only one year and it changed pretty quickly. And the problem is that everybody thinks that that's what a winning 3D printer looks like. So we got a bunch of similar looking printers coming from China. And the reason for that was not because they were copying or cloning or they were incapable of progressing the tech um, themselves. It's a struggle, that's true. Some of them aren't very good at progressing the tech, but the real reason is because they couldn't sell any printers that didn't look like a Prusa. But that all changed on the day that the 3D Print General released his review about this printer and showed just how amazing a consumer level, inexpensive FDM 3D printer can be. So why am I now doing a review? What is it, nine months later or something like that? It's because most of the early reviews and people want to get on there quickly to get on that, um, you know, the YouTube uh, algorithm bandwagon. If you're early, then you're going to get the views. And if you're late, you're probably not. But the, most of those guys had beta test units. This is a fully production unit. And there's been a lot of developments and subtle things which weren't talked about, weren't discussed. And I also think I can add a whole lot of value as far as what I normally do on this channel. And that is diving into the minutia, every little detail about a printer and why it was designed or produced that way. And in the case of this printer, it's probably going to be a destructive disassembly because there's things that are like glued together and I don't think I'm ever gonna get them back together after we've taken it apart. So we're gonna do this review in three parts. Part one, we're gonna do a sort of surface level analysis of what's going on. Part two, I'm going to do some prints, including some test prints using this four color AMS or automatic material system, which is an add-on you can purchase for this printer. And after I've done that, we're going to destructively take apart this printer and see what it's really made out of. Let's get into it. I'm just gonna reach back here, turn the printer on so we can get our first impressions. And the first thing I noticed is just how sharp this touch screen is. It's basically a cell phone screen about twice the resolution, at least to my eye, twice the resolution compared to the other touch screens on 3D printers, which I've reviewed in the past. And the firmware here is absolutely gorgeous and just flawless as far as, um, you know, the first going over it. And look at this, like the renderings for all of the print files that you have on, uh, stored on the machine. Instead of having to memorize names, you can just look at the pictures. This is the um, sort of control interface and in that singular screen they have almost uh, every control that you would really want to have from temperature to movement to homing all that stuff here on the home screen you've got the information that you're going to need when the thing is actually printing and this little button up here at the top turns the chamber light on and off you guys can see it in there so yeah this is just amazing you guys Clearly, they did all the work themselves. Typically, these Chinese companies are buying the um, electronics from another Chinese company that's developed the firmware. And so all of the different printer brands all have the same firmware and sort of touch interface. But with Bamboo, we're seeing something completely unique and just amazing as far as functionality goes. This is the iPhone of 3D printers. Despite what that other company wants you to believe, this one is it. We have glass 
actual glass, not plastic, inset on an aluminum frame. Same with the front door here, and that brings us to the first major complaint that I have about this printer. That is the fact that the door opens to the point where it hits the frame here. And if my five-year-old kid came walking through this room, I could see him slapping that and flexing it to the point. You can see it flexes right here. But if you push it too far, it's gonna shatter this glass. So I would like to see uh, two slits right here in this outer protective cover, which would give you access to the frame on the inside, and then you could install a double hinge, like a, a dual pivot point hinge, and you could get that door to open up all the way until it touches the side of the printer here. So let's pretend like the top here is the door. It would open all the way until it touches like so, and you can't break it because it's sitting flat up against the printer. Another option would be something like this recessed hinge, and you guys might have seen these. They're really fancy. So as you open them up, they sort of pop outwards, like they, they separate from each other, and then they go around a corner. So um, this thing could work, but you would still only get a 90 degree open, and you would still have a stop point putting pressure on the hinges and potentially breaking the glass there as well. So you really want that glass to open all the way to the side. As you guys saw, there's a top piece of glass which sits in there on top of this foam gasket, and it's pretty nice, flush mounted as well. And the AMS unit just sits right down on top of the glass like that. It can still sort of slide around, even though there are rubber feet, which prevent scratching of the glass. Uh, you know what would have been cool is to have the AMS have the same sort of base profile as the glass there, so that you could pull the glass out and the AMS would sit in its place. There might be reasons why they didn't do that, so I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt here. I haven't given it a lot of thought. It's just sort of my first inclination, so. There's no doubt that the team who designed this are total professionals with access to all of the top-notch manufacturing um, capabilities, you know, all the machinery that they need to bend aluminum and that kind of a thing. So uh, they know what they're doing. There's nothing DIY about this. There are two buttons here at the top, flush, kind of nice, the first button is a power button, which turns the screen off, but it doesn't fully turn the printer off. If you look in there, you can still see the light. The three-quarter view of this printer shows off just how gorgeous it is. There's the plug for your micro SD card if you can't connect to the printer in some other way to get the files onto it. And there's no screws visible on the outside here at the front or the side except these hinge screws right there, and you know, of course down below. On the back side, it's another story. We have tons of screws visible all over the place, but this is the ugly business end, so nothing too surprising there. I've got it set up with the single mount for a single roll of filament, which would go on there just like so, and then feed into this hole right here. This part is already mounted to it. This is the auxiliary thing for the AMS, and it's a spring-loaded mechanism to, to keep jams from happening. But you know what I really wanna talk about right now, you guys, is this, a spool from Bamboo Lab that comes apart. So we're finally seeing this um, recyclable spool idea that came from Rich Wrap years ago, and ah, oh, just so many props and kudos and accolades to Bamboo Lab for finally selling this uh, you know, bringing it to the mass market. I'm really, really happy about that. What it means is you can buy filament cartridges, not an entire spool, so you're not throwing away all of this plastic. This here is the backside of the poop chute, not my words, but you know, it's the waste chute where the um, filament change happens. So because it's a single nozzle in there, when you're changing filament colors, you're going to have to just sort of bleed through a certain amount to get the nozzle expunged of all the previous color. And so that's gonna, the wasted material is just gonna drop right out the back here and you put some sort of a box or a catch uh, to deal with all that. Beautiful aluminum CNC handle here. Feels really nice in the hand. I mean, the user experience on this printer is phenomenal. And we can see the bed here with the detachable print surface. I've already coated it with glue stick and done a benchy print, which you can see the remnants there in the glue stick, but the stick them down, or I don't know what to call it, the holding force here of that bed is is quite substantial, which is weird because I don't feel any like um, grid of magnets. So I don't feel any like magnetic points, like nine magnets in there or something like that. It feels uniform all the way across 
the bed. So I'm curious to know how they got this to stick down on that with so much force. All right, I found another thing that I would change about the physical design of this printer, and it has everything to do with those gray pieces of plastic on the back side of the heated bed here. You can see it there and there, and what these things are is alignment devices to capture the print surface. So as I put the print surface there, you can see it easily aligns at the back edge. But getting this side to line up is not as easy because at an angle, which is the way you're gonna load it, it, um, it can just easily float right over the top of the sides. So if I put it down like so, we can see it snaps home with quite a bit of force. I showed you guys a minute ago just how well held down that is. But um, we've got a ski jump thing going on right here because this corner of the bed is having to sit on top of that plastic and it's not easy. I'm really, I gotta force it to slide it off. And I think, I think that's good enough. So yeah, this is, this is no good. I would definitely come up with some sort of a different solution. I don't have anything in mind off the top of my head, but there's gotta be a better way to do it. Taking a look inside from the top, the first thing that jumps out at me is these carbon fiber rods and hence the wording of Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. I have the power turned off, the screen is turned off, but the stepper motors are still locking this head in place so I cannot move this by hand. If I come down here, turn off that switch, light turns off, and now of course I can move things. We have a Core XY movement system, so there's the lower belt and the upper belt, and the funny thing is we have a large gap between those belts. So um, hmm, there must be a reason that they did that for um, force vectoring. You want those belts to be as close together as possible. You would like them to be like right in line with each other, but that's not possible. So you, you, re you really want to stack them one on top of the other. So there must be something that they're putting here on the print head or the X carriage, I should say. Uh, there must be some consideration that has to happen in between those belts, but that's pretty interesting to me. Up here we can see a nice cable chain. It plugs in with this pivoting mechanism. And when I first got the printer, I don't want to pull that out and break it, but it was kind of hanging out, so I had to stick that back in there. Not a big deal. The Bowden tube here is kind of a reverse Bowden. It's just meant to help guide the filament into the nozzle because there is a direct drive mechanism here on the nozzle. And if you do get a jam, like if the filament breaks back here somewhere in the reverse Bowden, it's really quite easy, I've figured out, to just push down right here and then pull the tube and it comes right out. Nice and easy to use. They don't complicate things and make it hard for the end user. And right there is the number one value proposition of this printer, this phenomenal idea of using LiDAR for the self calibration and to make sure that your first layer goes down perfectly. You know, I have one simple request and that is to have 3D printers with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. Now, evidently, my cycloptic colleague informs me that only Bamboo Labs has made that happen. And it appears to be somebody in China at DJI, where they use lots of LiDAR on their DJI drones. So um, I'm eating my words, you guys. I've said in the past that I haven't seen any innovation coming from China. No groundbreaking anything. Everything they've done is derivative or a direct copy of something that somebody from the West came up with as far as 3D printing goes. And that is the very first thing that I've seen that just makes me go, wow, what a unique, crazy good idea coming from a Chinese mind. So I was wrong. Chinese people can be creative. Look at that. That's strange. There's like a door there. I wonder, I wonder what that does. <laughs> There's like nothing behind it. What is that? Oh, I got to figure this out now. Oh, it's your... Uh, it's your filter. All right, I pulled this filter out of the slot so you guys can see just how substantial that is. Absolutely the most serious uh, air filter I've ever seen in a 3D printer, bar none. This is at a whole new level all by itself. And you might've heard the little tink, tink, tink noises as I was pulling that out of the slot. That's these little pellets of charcoal, basically. That's carbon. And if I kind of disassemble the, uh, the filter here at the gap, I could get more of those to fall out, but you know it's not gonna be a problem once you get this installed. So what's going on is the carbon there does a process called adsorption, AD, adsorption. Um, as the air passes over it, it removes the VOCs, volatile organic chemicals from the air. So when you're printing with ABS and you have your ABS fumes, this should take the bulk of them out. Now, uh, there might be a little bit of, of a question here because from what I understand, um, what we're getting is microparticulates 
So not fumes, not VOCs, but microparticulates from um, these types of printers, from FDM printers. So uh, yeah, that's an amazing thing to have, but um, it might not be quite correct. What we really might want is a micron filter, something that, that just filters for size particles instead of chemicals. And here's the other end of the poop chute, and it's kind of interesting. There's this lever right here, which activates this trap door. So when the print head moves back, it, you can hear it pushing on that lever. So it activates the lever, which keeps this Teflon coated piece of metal in the way as you drop your molten filament will sort of puddle up or spiral up in a little blob right there on the trap door. And then the filament gets cut as the nozzle gets uh, brushed across this piece of PTFE liner. Now that's also Teflon. So um, you can see it's on a flexible piece of plastic or you know rubbery TPU, something or other. And then there's just this little piece of Bowdoin tube, just like this. And what a great solution for cutting the filament. I've never seen that solution before either. So hey, creative solution number two, there's been many ways that people have implemented nozzle cleaning on their printers, but never that. And I'm supposing that you can just pop that little, maybe there's like a screw in there and you just pop that off and you can put a new piece of PTFE tube on there. Really, really great idea. The whole poop shoot really is creative. This whole uh, lever arm might be overcomplicated. Maybe not, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think you could simplify it any more than that. I think this is good stuff. Um, yeah, so you know the the nozzle activates the trap door as the nozzle comes into it. The trap door goes as the nozzle goes away. The trap door opens. So uh, that's really creative. You know, this is really the whole printer making me eat my words. I, I'm just floored by the quality of thinking behind everything here. But looking at the underside of the printer, I'm finding the third thing that I would like to see changed on this printer. We have one, two three lead screw pulleys and these are what drives the z axis the bed up and down in the uh, you know like this and that is the tensioner right there which is spring loaded and that is the single belt attached to the stepper motor spindle that will drive all three of these lead screws simultaneously i would have liked to have seen individual stepper motors driving each of these lead screws and then we could physically level the bed every time we uh, calibrate the machine. Now, it's not that critical. This is gonna work just fine. And considering the fact that stepper motors cost like $5 a piece, adding two more is gonna add $10 to the printer. So that's not insubstantial. I can see as a cost cutting measure why they would do it. You'd be able to get rid of this thing. So that's like what a dollar worth of stuff there. So $9 added to the printer. And you could drive the lead screws directly with a stepper motor at each corner, at each of the corners of the triangle. So I think $9 is worth it to be able to physically level the bed in space. That would just be such a cool bit of functionality. So yeah, I really wish that they hadn't driven all three lead screws with just a single motor. Then again, decoupling all three of these lead screws would mean that we would have to have pivot points at each of the attachments of the bed to the lead screws. And not only do they have to pivot for when the bed droops here, but the hypotenuse of the triangle, as it grows, it needs to expand. So we also need some sort of a slide action. And it gets really expensive to design such a sliding, pivoting joint. So it's completely understandable why they didn't put that functionality in here. It would have been so cool, but this functions perfectly well in the real world and it saves money. And we all know cost is king. So I guess they made the right decision, but darn it, I still wanna see individually driven lead screws. You can see over here, this is the, the door. That's the handle to open the door on the outside of the printer. And there's a calibration board right here, which is super interesting. It sits just shy of the print surface. So it's, it's, it's down lower than the print surface. And it's got these markings on it like you would expect to see um, a camera using. Like if you had a camera and you had to calibrate the camera. So does this LiDAR unit somehow use a camera or is LiDAR able to detect the ink on the calibration, because this is smooth. There's no texture there. So that is um, confusing and intriguing. I have to figure that out. And then there's this random QR code here. I don't know what that's for. It's just a serial number maybe, or some way to keep track of the components that go onto this printer. Strange. The stepper motors for the XY control are located in the back corners. And that requires you to put sort of a complicated series of bends. So you can see the belts go farther back, they come parallel to this pulley right here, then they wrap around this pulley, they go back to the back wall, and they pop out right here. So 
Um, there's two pulleys back there that you don't need if you would mount the stepper motors up here at the front. But if you mount them at the front, then that requires you to bump the whole frame, this whole uh, cubic shaped thing, farther forward off the front edge of the bed. And as it's designed, that bed is pretty close to the glass door, and that is a very nice thing. So I'm glad they moved those back there, even if from an engineering standpoint, that, uh, that's not as ideal. So there's a little example of form over function. This isn't purely an engineer's project. They clearly did some things which are less ideal from an engineering standpoint to make the human interaction more pleasant. If I pop the cover off of the X carriage, we can see that there is a part cooling fan with a very interesting fan duct. I've never quite seen this before. It's not quite split cooling, split part cooling. It's kind of creating a vortex because of these two ducts being offset from one another. So it's gonna create a spiral of air around the nozzle, supposedly. Uh, I don't know, I'll try to test that out somehow. But that's not the only part cooling that this printer has because there's also this massive, massive fan here on the side. This is the duct and the fan is just enormous. That's it right there next to my fingers, right? So it's, it's about as big as my fist. And that creates just a general draft across the top of the print. And the neat thing about having a bed which drops is that this doesn't have to move. So Core XY would be about the only way to use a fan such as this. So between those two part cooling um, solutions, you're able to print at very high speeds. And there's a nice little button here on the touch interface for each of those fans, and those fans are the reason this printer is just so noisy. So if I hit the, uh, what is that? That's gonna be the general cooling. That's this one right here. Very, very loud. I love the animation. As long as the fan blades are spinning, it's telling you. And even though it's turned off, it's showing that the fan blades are still spinning. Very cool. And then here we go. That's what the part cooling here at the at the nozzle sounds like. So combined, this is not gonna be a pleasant printer to be in the same room with as it's printing. Although the mass of the glass, the, this is not plastic, the glass here acts as a great insulator for the, you know, the sound waves and it does quiet things down quite a bit. There's a rubber boot over the hot block and partially covering the nozzle, which is what you want to see. And right there are the cooling fins for the heat sink on the cold end of the hot end. So this is the replacement part that comes in the box, just in case you ever need to, you know, replace this. That would probably be user error. Or maybe you wore out the nozzle, I don't know. But um, yeah, you can see those are the fins that we're looking at. So it mounts in there just like so. And this is a very proprietary part on a very proprietary printer. If you love open source and you consider patents to be the devil and proprietary things to be, um, you know, evil capitalistic ploy to get you to buy more engineered obsolescent things, uh, then this printer is not for you probably. But in my judgment, this kind of thing was not done nefariously. It's just the best design that they could come up with. And the final thing we're talking about here on the hot end is this lever arm that activates that slider that slides in and out of the filament path. So I assume that this is for cutting the filament uh, upon color changes. The problem with using a single nozzle for multiple materials, or mostly multiple colors, is as you are retracting that filament, there is a stringy tail that's attached to it. And so if you can just retract a little bit and then cut the tail off and leave the tail, all that molten filament, leave it right there, and then purge it out with the next color, that's a much better strategy, totally a winning strategy. If you look back at my old, old video, I'll link it in the descriptions from like six years ago where I was just really struggling with a DIY single nozzle filament changer. And uh, if I had had something like this, problem solved. So from the other side here, we can see how this arm gets activated. The print nozzle goes all the way to the front and then slides over and you guys can see there's a little boss right there. A little piece of plastic that sticks out and that filament arm hits that. And that so this printer, is a conglomeration of the most amazing feature set that we've ever seen in the realm of consumer level 3D printing. How on earth was Bamboo Lab able to show up and on the day they arrived, they're beating the pants off of every other already established 3D printer company. It's phenomenal. Part of the answer is the fact that they have so much talent at their company. 
many PhDs in mechanical wor engineering working there. They come from DJI. The founder was a bigwig at DJI, which is probably the world's largest drone company, right? So they had access to all of the most advanced manufacturing processes. And they, as engineers, had experience working with the production engineers. They knew how to design for production, all of these things. But that still doesn't explain how they were able to bypass or leapfrog the development process, which is an iterative process where you start out with a basic design, the first design, then you uh, make a prototype because you can't just make the production version straight away. You make a prototype version, you ship off your prototype version to a test audience and they run it through its paces, give you feedback and you redesign it. So design, prototype, test. That's the rinse, lather, repeat cycle that leads to great products. And you can do that all in house or it can just sort of generally happen in the environment, but that is the process that leads to great uh, things. So by looking at the internet and seeing what everybody in the community, and I don't like that word because mm, the dominant company up until now has kind of mm, co-opted the word to be their own and they try to control the community. So I prefer to call it the hobby, but the people in the hobby uh, the very talented engineers who DIY their printers have been teaching everybody how to make the best product and Bamboo Lab was paying attention. And to Bamboo Lab's credit, they are giving credit where credit is due. For instance, on their Kickstarter page, they acknowledged that Havort, the YouTube channel, with his Mirage C printer, taught them how to make the very large um, fan that has the duct, the static duct that doesn't move to blow a general breeze across the entire print. That's where they got that idea. And without that cooling solution, you would not be able to print as quickly as the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon prints. So they are giving some credit, but they're not giving enough credit. For instance, that printer that you're seeing there absolutely would never have existed without the immense talent from a guy who made a YouTube channel called Tech2C. An Australian guy, he took his uh, Prusa i3 and converted it into what he called the Hypercube, and then um, after doing that, he started with aluminum rods because they were lightweight with a copper bushing, I believe. And he quickly moved on to carbon fiber rods with a plastic bushing. Carbon fiber rods, Bamboo Labs X1 Carbon. 100% thanks to Tech2C. So they, they are thanking everybody. And I do think there's a long list of people that Bamboo Lab owes an immense gratitude to. And I would love to see a thank you page. <laughs> on their website saying thank you to all of these creators for making this printer happen. But it goes deeper than that because let's look about, let's talk about the software, the firmware. This is very derivative of Clipper to the point where it's basically Clipper. It's just rewritten, which is why they don't have to share it open source. So Clipper written in Python. This is one way that they could have done it. Maybe they rewrote their firmware entirely in C++. Since they didn't use any of the code, they were using their human eyeballs to read the Python coding, learning what the functionality did, and then they were just rebuilding that same functionality in C++, but they didn't use any of the same code, which means that they are not violating the open source agreement. The spirit of the law was not violated, but it's absolutely a violation of the spirit of open source. The spirit of open source is, hey, I taught you how to do a thing, and I put it out there, like not closed source where you, where you can't see the human, you know, understandable code language. You can read the code, you can understand what's going on. And the idea is that when you get that, you learn from me and then you share back into the knowledge base so that people after you, you're paying it forward. People later on can learn what you've added. And Bamboo Labs isn't sharing. They're not. They've locked it all up proprietary. And that's, eh, that's kind of egregious. So if you love open source, that's the printer that you could aim some negative emotions towards. And that would be pretty deserved on their part. But what are they gonna do? They exist in China. China is a den of thieves. 100% tomorrow, if they released that open source, there would be copycats using their code. So they basically just gave their intellectual property away. Here you go, copy us, put us out of business. All the time and effort, all the people that they had to employ to, to, to write the, the code, to develop the product, all that money would just be wasted because somebody else would reap the, reap the rewards. So, it's a hard thing, this intellectual property um, problem. And uh, the debate is never gonna go away. All right, we've seen all of the features individually. Now let's see how well they dance together and print. 
All right, this is the very first print that I ever sliced and sent to this printer. Opening up that door, I can smell some of the ABS fumes, and even though it has that filter back in there, I was still getting that ABS smell here in the room, that feeling at the back of your throat like you might be getting sick that you get when you're printing around ABS. And if I pull this bed off, we can get a look at the print, and I'm seeing quite a few zits. Now, that's the start-stop places. I had them randomized because I want this part to be as strong as it can. And yeah, that smells quite strongly of ABS. This is some of the bamboo branded ABS itself. And I printed on the, what is they calling this? This is the engineering plate. Even though this side says uh, ABS, um, the slicer wouldn't let me print on the, what is this, the cold plate side. So I had to print here on the engineering plate. And I used some of this, uh, what is it? Nano polymer adhesive, the overpriced stuff from Vision Miner. It works really well though, but man, $50 for this bottle? That's a ripoff for sure. I <sighs> wish there was a better alternative. You might be able to make your own. Nobody's tried that yet. There's an idea for somebody to make a video about. DIY nano polymer adhesive. Anyway, here we go. Peeling it off. It is stuck really well with that nano polymer. So well. It actually tore part of the print off the bottom. And here is that functional print installed onto this antique Duro bandsaw project of mine. You can follow the link right here if you want to see this project. Pretty cool project, but even with that uh, hole there in the underside, nobody will notice that, and it's still perfectly functional, so I'm just going to leave it. This is a replacement because I did something stupid and broke the original mount that I made out of PLA. So it's a little bit of an upgrade now being made out of ABS. Speaking of printing an ABS on this machine here, a couple of things to note. First of all, I have this other print surface where I've coated this side with glue stick for printing PLA, but this side is uncoated. Glue stick or nanopolymer adhesive, nothing on that. And from what I'm reading in the forums, people are having good luck printing ABS directly onto this plastic with no coating. It pops right off after it gets cool. So I should have done it that way. I think it's the nanopolymer adhesive that just gave it too much stick. But that filter in there that's meant to filter out the, the fumes, the VOCs, volatile organic compounds, doesn't do anything. And I, I printed that thing maybe two days ago, and I've had horrible allergies and just... My sinuses have been driving me nuts in this room ever since. So just that singular ABS print has ruined the room. Now it's really well sealed up in here. You can see up there in the ceiling, I've got a vent and I need to run that and just cycle the air out, get the air out of here. That actually has a nice fan. It's like a, va it's like a bathroom fan on steroids. I can evacuate all the air out of here. But uh, I don't have the air exchanger hooked up to that vent yet. This is kind of a work in progress in my office here. And so it's like 20 degrees outside. This is my gravel driveway. And I don't want to make it all cold in here. So I've just been kind of suffering through the allergies. But yeah, printing ABS is no joke. It's just so toxic. And I would rather that they didn't put that filter into there. I mean, I don't know how much that costs to add the fan and the, the filter unit itself and all that, but it doesn't accomplish anything. It's a total failure as far as I'm concerned. So better just to not have us pay for that added functionality when it doesn't do anything. This natural colored nylon filament I got from China years ago has bested every 3D printer it's ever come in contact with. And the Bamboo Lab X1 is no exception. Look at this, it peels up the bed instead of, <laughs> instead of peeling off the bed. It's just incredible. And if I wait until everything cools down, the print surface snaps back to the magnetic sub bed and the print looks like this. Trying to do a print here with carbon fiber nylon and I got this error code so I can just resume the print if there's no problem, but let's look in there and see. Nope, there's a problem. So it caught that one. I need to do the nanopolymer coating on that particular print surface. Try it again. 
it is super annoying how before every print, it's got to go through this whole auto calibration cycle. You know, it can't just uh, remember what it did last time because I'm sending the same print to it. So what I really want is a button right here on the screen to say, skip auto calibration this time. The Bamboo Lab Slicer does give you this ability when you are at your computer and you click the print plate button to wirelessly send the print to the machine, you get these three check boxes in the dialog box that pops up. So unclicking those will skip auto calibration, but what I want is the ability to do this at the printer right at the beginning of a print. Speaking of the slicer, it is an open source fork of Super Slicer, which is itself a fork of Prusa Slicer, which is itself a fork of Slick 3R. Here's a Bamboo Lab blog from eight months ago talking about uh, the open source-ness of their project. And what's interesting in the fact that the Bamboo Lab Slicer is open source is the fact that they did some really fantastic work to make the text functionality in the slicer. So this isn't CAD work. This is all being done in the slicer. And they, they did some great work to make that highly functional. And it looks like being open source, Prusa took that and ran with it because now you can see that Prusa is getting their text on a curve to work. Pretty amazing surface modeling stuff. So this is a fantastic illustration of how a free open source software combined with a free and open capitalistic marketplace combine to cause companies to compete, which ends up giving the highest possible value for the least possible money to you and me as the end consumers. Everything is working the way that it's supposed to. One thing Bamboo Lab did to set themselves apart from all of their other Chinese peers, and that is to get their software approved. So you know that you're not downloading a virus because Windows has approved it, Mac OS has approved it, the Android store, the Apple iPhone store, all these places, you know you're not going to be putting some spyware on your devices, which is a good peace of mind. But you are forced to create an account on the cloud with... Bamboo Lab. And I don't know if that means that they just want your files. Don't do top secret stuff with this, you know? You can put it onto an SD card and walk it over to the printer, but to really get the full functionality, uh, you need to register. And I tried registering with Bamboo, but the link just seemed to be broken. And then like a day later, or maybe it was two days later, I got like a series of emails, like 10 emails in a row, all the times that I tried to submit to get the code to make an account with Bamboo Lab. So... It's buggy for sure, but you can log in using your Google account. It's not too hard. Let's contrast that experience with the way that Wi-Fi is accomplished using a Duet control board. The Duet board itself is the website and also the server, so it holds the files. So you basically log in through your browser and you click this button right there to send the files to your duet control board on a, you know, controlling a 3D printer and it's all right there. So you have complete control on your network of your 3D printers. You're not having to sign into a cloud. Making their firmware closed source while referencing open source is not great, but the fact that they are getting control or seeing everything that you do with your printer when you buy a Bamboo Lab printer. Nobody in industry is going to buy these printers. None of these companies are gonna be so stupid as to sign onto a cloud controlled by a Chinese company. So they are massively limiting their reach by making this um, that you must use their network and you're beholden to their servers and to their cloud services if you want to print in this pain-free way. It's, it's not good. And I wanna show you guys just how much bullshit it is that they're making you print through the cloud. Here you can see all these beautiful rendered models. These are the models that Bamboo Lab sliced for you that you can print, that's their suggestions. That model right there is this little rubber band gun that I downloaded off of Thingiverse. And I think I wanna print it again in the color red tomorrow. But right now I've got a different print to send. So I wanna save that model right here, this slice. It worked out great, I wanna save it. Well, if I go to click it to save it, all it wants to do is delete it. No, I don't want to delete it. How can I save that model on the machine? I have an SD card in the slot right now. See, there's storage available right here on the machine, but I can't save it. 
Over here on the slicer, I've already clicked on slice, and then I clicked on print plate, which got me this, and it says send print job to, and it only gives me one option because I only have one Bamboo Lab printer. So I must send it through the cloud. I don't have any way to take it from this slicer onto an SD card. I can't even save to an SD card here at my computer. So what's the point in giving me an SD card if you won't even allow your slicer to put it on an SD card? Apparently it's just to allow third party slicers to run the printer, although we're gonna lose a lot of functionality. I really don't like how trapped I feel within the Bamboo Lab ecosystem. It feels like this portends of bad things to come when Bamboo Lab is the dominant 3D printer company. The last print that I did was using some of this PA, that's nylon, polyamide, carbon fiber impregnated. And that prints at like 265 degrees. Well, the next print I wanna do is with some red PLA, and that prints at a maximum of like 240 degrees. So purging the nozzle of nylon when at print temperatures of PA or of PLA, I don't think that's gonna work. I don't know if Bamboo Lab has some procedure in place or not, but I'm not gonna take any chances. I'm just gonna do this manually. So this here is a little stick of some ABS and I can use the ABS to flush the nylon at like 265 degrees and then the um, PLA will flush the ABS at like 240 degrees. Now I know the Bamboo Lab is all kinds of smart and there's probably a workflow that they have in mind for this sort of thing, but I would really appreciate other options. There's an unload filament button, but I would like a load filament button where it assumes that you've got the filament right up to the feeding mechanism in there and it will purge through enough filament to blast out whatever was left in the nozzle from the last color. Well, it did pop an error from that, but that's not the right error. I also got this notification on my phone, which is cool. Wow, the printer is really struggling. So I think my surface here is just contaminated. You can't see it back behind there, but it says it was inspecting the first layer. So the first layer defects were detected. So yeah, it's not gonna let it print. Really awesome that the printer has this functionality. See, what had happened was I dried that nylon in my filament dryer, then I stored it in my vacuum pot here. And that oil right there has a tendency in this pump to work its way all the way up the hose and into the vacuum chamber. And it dripped onto the nylon filament. I respooled that nylon, which I've, I've had this filament for like five years, and I respooled it onto this Polyterra spool. And if I, you know, you can see my fingers, they're dry, there's nothing on them. And if I stick them all in here in the filament, uh, yeah, a little shiny. So there's some oil still, and I can definitely feel it. Well, passing all that through the, uh, the nozzle here on the Bamboo Lab was able to just sort of collect the oil right there at the tip. Hopefully I don't have any lasting damage, but I wiped the spots of oil off the bed and now this print is proceeding perfectly. Seven hours and 10 minutes of printing later, I printed this overnight and what is it? So it takes the uh, filament that pops out of the, uh, the poop chute here and it drops it around the corner. It is disappointing that it doesn't clear the filament spool. You can see I have problems with collision there. I might make it. The little bits of filament might jump over the gap. But if you're using filament back here, that means you have access to the back of the machine and you don't need this. So in that case, just put like a cardboard box under here. You can find this print on Thingiverse by searching for Poopy Shoe. This is some high speed, low drag business right here. Let me show you guys just how this works. Automatically winds the filament from the AMS. And back here, we're gonna see it popping into this tube all the way through down to here. There it is, all the way to there. We'll retract. From red to blue. I've got this three color print going. It's gonna look like that. A yellow cube and or, or a red sphere and a blue pyramid, a three-sided pyramid. And you can see this massive purge block way back there, way bigger than the test print. You guys see that tiny little yellow dot? It's having to purge all this material on there, having to purge this material here at the back. Look at all this, just to make a single tiny little yellow dot. There it is doing this prime tower, or purge tower, whatever you want to call it, so that it can print the next layer. And I'm already purging or priming the nozzle here at the back end through the poop chute. So I think I set this print up incorrectly. 
and I don't want to waste two more hours of printing with a prime tower and waste all this filament, so I'm just going to stop this print and resend it. In fairness, this um, purge tower, prime tower, is not solid. It's definitely got some hollowness to it, so it's not quite as, um, as much filament as you would think going on inside of there, but still, that's substantial. So this is one of the flushes that made it down the poop chute back here, and you can see that the yellow, it's flushing from blue to yellow, and the yellow is about the same length as the blue, but we really only need it to flush to right about there where my thumbnail is, to where the blue just stops being blue and it, and it fully turns yellow. So here in the slicer, I can just select flushing options and I can change that. It was 280, I changed it down to 200. All right, let's see what we got here. That little part there, really nice looking. And all this is the waste to make that. And that is the problem with using a single nozzle. I didn't even have to try. Literally, I didn't change any settings. I pretty much just assigned colors to the different shapes and pressed print. Taking a close look at this print, we can see the orange color down here at the bottom corner of the cube, meaning I didn't quite purge enough of the red filament from the nozzle. Also the underside of the sphere, kind of not looking perfect, but that's a problem with the print design and not with the printer. The printer performs just amazingly. I cannot emphasize enough how easy that was. I did this before years ago. I'll show you guys a picture and that took me days to accomplish. I had to create my own firmware uh, and it was, it was quite the chore. Today's print here visible on the left hand side there in a close up view and on the right hand side right there is the print that I made like five years ago. And that was the one that I had to custom make a printer just to accomplish this with a custom firmware build. And I didn't have the fancy cutting mechanism that's in the Bamboo Lab printer. So you can see all that yellow contamination in the blue from the color changes. And the fact that it took me like two weeks of my life to accomplish this. And this one was just basically plug and play. So there is the march of progress. Got my tools out. Let's see what this machine is hiding inside. Well, this is the first 3D printer I've ever reviewed with a void if tampered with sticker. So they don't want you pulling that screw out and getting inside this machine. All right, I got the back plate off and we're starting to see some of the business going on inside of this printer. But these four screws here on the side for the you know the wrap around here for the side panel aren't the only screws that hold the side panel on there's these hidden screws that go right here and there so this is some top notch industrial design i don't understand how they're recouping the money that went into the r d phase of this printer with a sale price that's as low as it is for this unit it's like a lost leader even like there's got to be something else going on that they'd be willing to sell this printer for such a low price all right, even with all four of these screws here at the back, these three across the top right in there, and there's one right down there in the middle, and even with all eight of those screws removed, this panel barely would wiggle. So this is some secure uh, <coughs> construction we've got going on here. It might be bonded, like glued to the frame, I don't know, but at any rate, you can see the back side of this panel all through here, and there's really no reason for me to take this panel off. There's nothing hiding back behind there. On this side of the printer, it's kind of the same story. You don't need to take that panel off. You just need to take this cover plate. So there's two screws that hold it from right here. And then this, this plate just sort of snaps into place and covers up everything in there. So this is gonna be your control board for the screen here. And the screen is gonna be just a screen. That's why the bezel is so thin, I'm guessing. Although that is still thicker than a cell phone, so mm, I don't know. But this does seem to be the electronics to control the screen. Back here, we can see this electronics board buried in there, and that's gonna be the main control board for the printer. There's the power supply. There's the vent fan that I was telling you guys about. Totally unnecessary, because that filter behind there does nothing, in my experience. Uh, maybe the science says that it removes 50% of the VOCs or the microparticulates or whatever you want to call it out of the air, but it's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough. So this is a whole system that I would just not be charging the consumer for. There's our stepper motor for the Z axis, and you can start to see the routing on the belts. Those are doing some crazy angles 
to get around the stepper motors here for the XY movement. That other pulley we were looking at just now is directly in line, so it's coming more than 90 degrees. So we've got one, two, three pulleys. And that pulley is pretty smart because it's back at an angle to where the belt comes off of this pulley here at such an angle to clear all the plastic, but it's also setting up the, the run, the line on the belt right here to run right down the side of the printer. Here's the part of the electronics that makes no sense to me. It's basically in the chamber with the heated bed. So you can see this big old gap right here. There's also a gap up under the poop chute. And that means that all the heated air coming off the bed, and yeah, it's got some fans moving the, the air around in here. So there is a little bit of airflow back behind these sort of plasticky bits. But that electronics package is getting every bit as warm as your print. So we're talking maybe 50 degrees is pretty standard temperatures. Well, of course the electronics isn't gonna melt down at 50 degrees, but it's not, not gonna be good for the longevity of it. So there's a sort of engineered obsolescence moment, although you could say, no, no, they weren't trying to make it so that it's gonna break. They're just, uh, you know, cutting corners or just making things easier. Packaging, they're just packaging it nicely and they don't wanna isolate the electronics because that would cost that much more money. Well, why didn't they combine the filtration system with a, you know, ventilation system to go around the electronics? They could have had the air that's being sucked out of here uh, to, to clean the, you know, the VOCs out of the print chamber, and they could have had that flowing right over here over the electronics. I guess it's not necessary, too complicated, but if it were me, this whole electronics package would be outside of the chamber. I had thought about putting insulation around the entire outside of this printer and turning it into a heated and sealed chamber, but now seeing that, uh, if I get that chamber hot, like 70 degrees, we're seriously going to be damaging the electronics eventually. And speaking of sealed, here's the foam gasket for the top glass, and the front door as well has a plastic gasket, so it's halfway to being sealed and insulated. We could just insulate the thing and start printing at higher chamber temperatures, but that will kill our electronics. The hot end extruder X carriage assembly is always the most important part of a 3D printer, and this one here is the most impressive one that I've ever seen. There's just so much going on here. Starting off with this very compact hot end that we've seen, I already showed it to you, and look at that nice little fan. That's lightweight, so you can really move it around quite quickly, as we've seen how quickly this printer prints. And the extruder is designed with the same sort of goals in mind. Lightweight and so much functionality just packed into such a tiny little package here. Starting with the guillotine, this little blade that's activated by the lever here, and that blade slices the filament as it comes through the filament path right down there. Now the blade is beveled on both sides, which is surprising to me. I would have thought that it would have been a better idea to put a little metal insert inside of the hole right there and to have like a scissors single bezel, but um, or bevel I should say. But um, yeah, I guess it works. These guys are very intelligent. You know, PhDs in mechanical engineering, I think they know what they're doing probably better than me. It's probably less expensive to just make this a plastic part and the, the double grind on that functions just fine, so why not go with it? Up here is the most impressive filament runout switch I've ever seen. Funny words to say, with just a switch, it's filament runout, but no, this is so, so smart. Look at that tiny, tiny little magnetic sensor right there. Microscopic. This thing is so lightweight, the wires for this PCB way more than the PCB itself. And if I put this Allen key down the filament path, we can see what happens. See that little lever arm? It gets moved just ever so slightly, and that is very, very magnetic. You can see it's it's like a neodymium magnet. It's, uh, it's very strong. The involute gears in the drivetrain look pretty similar to like the Sherpa Mini, so I'm guessing it's about a seven to one um, gear ratio, which is gonna be needed for that motor. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And the so-called hobbed gear, the, the part that grabs the filament, is a nicer diameter than typical. So um, being slightly larger, it's going to grab the filament a little better. Now, it's not as large as the new offerings from Bontech. Those are fantastic, but it seems to do the job just fine. There's the first hobbed gear directly being driven by the gear train, and then there's going to be a secondary gearing which catches this hobbed gear on that side so that as the filament feeds up the middle, it is grabbed from both sides, which leads to better grip and you're much less likely to strip out your filament. So this classic mechanism for holding um, 
PTFE tubing for the the, the so-called Bowden tube sits down inside of the mechanism when it's installed. And so if we look here at the top, we've got this collar and this collar is on slides. So the, uh, the, 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 the holes are sort of oblong and you can do that with it. So that's the sort of secondary trigger so that it makes it easier to load and unload the, uh, the Bowden tube if you need to clear a jam. This is the screw for adjusting the tension on the whole mechanism for how tightly it grabs the filament as it's feeding it through. And of course, we've got the LiDAR module. The laser, according to this warning sticker, comes out of that hole right there. And that is the camera that then detects the laser and does all the fancy LiDAR functionality. The X carriage body here is injection molded plastic. And if I'm really quiet and drag the knife along the edge here, we can hear that it is some sort of um, impregnated plastic, probably glass fiber reinforced, and it's pretty low. That didn't seem very crunchy. All the structural elements of the movement system are in fact made out of injection molded plastic. This is, that is, that is, that holds the bed, that down there, that's actually part of the bed. Even, I would say, the mounts for the guide rods look like they're plastic. So, what we have is a metal frame with a complex geometry made out of plastic bolted to it and then that holds everything so this is not a, a printer which is suitable for high temperatures which is why it doesn't have an actively heated chamber evidently bamboo lab doesn't think you're ever going to need to replace these bushings or the belts because to get to this stage where you could access those two elements you have to completely disassemble the X carriage, including taking off all of the electronics. So it's pretty intricate and delicate work. But when we get down to this level, it gets pretty interesting. These are bushings that I've never personally seen before. I had to look them up on Google. They are brass bushings with graphite inserts or, you know, some somehow they got the graphite to be in the holes. So this means that they are self-lubricating, meaning that the graphite will sort of sacrificially um, decay as it's being slid up and down on the rods, and that coats the rods with a graphite powder that provides the lubrication. If you've ever played with the pencil dust, you know how slippery graphite can be. So yeah, that's a really interesting solution. And the brass here has a Mohs hardness of 3.0, whereas the fibers in the carbon fiber rod have a Mohs hardness of 2.0. So anyone who's printed carbon fiber through a brass nozzle knows that even though it is the softer material, it can still wear out the brass. So the fact that these brass bushings are constantly sliding means that I think you will get a little bit of wear. Maybe it won't be too tragic, but it's going to be exacerbated by the fact that the uh, belts are offset from one another. For those of you who don't know, we have a tension going between the... Yeah, look, you see as I pull on this... That's the perfect illustration. Wow, that was perfect. As I pull that, you see how it twists it? I'm pulling from both corners now to twist it. But if I pull this corner, it's trying to twist the whole thing like so, which puts pressure on this corner here and on that corner there, and you know, alternately. So uh, you're, you're subjecting it to off-center loads, which is going to more quickly wear down your bushing. So I don't know the longevity. I'm... Mm, a little bit skeptical on the longevity of this system. And if it were me, I would have designed it to where it's more easy to replace these elements. But for the vast majority of consumers, I don't think you're going to put the tens of thousands of hours into this machine to where you're going to start getting a little bit of play in the X carriage. So for force vectoring, you would have placed the belts close to the center line here. So they're pulling symmetrically from the middle. But we couldn't do that because the motor, you can see, has its mounts right there in the center. So those two screws are what hold the little tiny stepper motor here onto the X carriage. So basically this is like a balancing act of trade-offs and I'm not sure that uh, for packaging considerations I could have done it any better, although it's possible. Speaking of the motor, it is the same form factor as what we've previously seen on other extruder assemblies like the Sherpa Mini here, but if you look at the side of it you can see that this one is going to be far more powerful. That stack of um, iron plates, the laser cut iron plates that are stacked there is significantly larger or thicker than what we're seeing here on the Sherpa Mini, the version I got here. So I'm guessing there's gonna be about twice the torque, because that's about twice the stack height, 
And that's important when you're trying to print at these very high speeds that the Bamboo Lab printer runs at. And speaking of high speeds, I forgot to mention it previously, but there's a very tall melt zone on this hot end, which allows you to get uh, better melt characteristics when printing quickly. Here's an interesting detail. There are springs on the top bushing, which keep the X carriage sort of spring loaded just for the top. It took me a minute to figure out what this is all about, but then I remembered Tech 2C. I told you about him before, and he had problems with there being a little bit of play, which allowed a little bit of click, click, click. So by spring loading this whole top mechanism, we are addressing all of those issues that he taught us about. So Bamboo Lab here really owes a debt of gratitude to Tech 2C. I was just starting to reassemble the X carriage and putting the two halves of this together, I accidentally pinched the ribbon cable. You can see I put a crease in it right there. Hopefully I didn't break any of the traces and I'm able to keep it functional. But like I said, this is a very delicate disassembly and reassembly. Hopefully you will never need to dig into the printer this deeply to replace the bushings or the belts. This is the thicker wire going to the bed, which means the voltage for the heater coils is going to travel through those wires. And that plugs in right there to that plug on this dedicated PCB. This PCB has mains voltage running to it and it has a solid state relay attached to it. So that's gonna be the control wires coming from the control board that turn the solid state relay on and off that send the voltage to the bed. But what's interesting to me is the transformer here. Look at that little miniature transformer. It's not too large. I wonder what's going on. Are they stepping down the voltage from 120 volts or something else? Like that is super interesting to me. If any of you are more expert in electronics than me, please weigh in in the comments and tell, tell us what's going on. If we lift up the bed here, we can see these other PCBs down here in the sub bed, and those are connected to some electronics that's right under here. There's a floating mounting point. I'll show it to you guys from the bottom as well. But basically, this boss here on the plastic part of the bed sits down onto this piece of metal right here, which floats. I've taken this pressure sensor off, and we can see that it is indeed a piezoelectric pickup. So that is why the nozzle taps the bed. It doesn't just gently go down and touch. Piezoelectric sensors detect vibrations in the metal. Think of it kind of like a microphone. This whole heated bed assembly seems to be bonded together into a solid piece, like glued together. But I want to dig into it and figure out what's going on. So I'm trying to unplug this. And theoretically, if this uh, assembly ever let you down, you could put a new one in. You could replace it. But they are not fooling around with the Celastic here. I cannot get this to detach. I've now broken off the little lever arm that you're meant to push down in order to separate the two halves of the connector here. And it's just, it's impossible to get this apart. I would have to destructively cut into this bulbous cover. I don't know what the point is in putting a clip there, like a connector, if it's this hard to get it. They might as well have just soldered it. This is just stupid. And I don't feel like buying a whole new bed for this printer just so that I can get it completely disassembled. We know it's going to be in there. It's the same thing as all the other heated beds. This is going to be the thermistor wire. There's a thermistor in the dead center of the bed there to tell you how hot or how cold the bed is. And that's going to be the wiring that goes to the traces that are going back and forth along the bottom of the PCB bonded to the aluminum plate that's inside there. So the only question we need to answer then is how thick is the aluminum plate and I hope you guys can see in there, it's about three millimeters thick. And the sticker, the uh, this Teflon sticker here is quite thick. It's another two millimeters thick and it protrudes a good four millimeters over the edge of the aluminum plate. So the aluminum plate does not go all the way to the edge of the bed. And if anyone is wondering why they coated this rubbery magnetic part of the sub bed with Teflon, it's because the standard rubbery magnetic things tend to bond permanently to the metal um, you know, flexible print surface when it's left on there for extended periods of time. Now my solution to this is to sprinkle just a slight tiny bit of talcum powder and to spread it out across the surface and that problem just goes away. So coating the whole thing with Teflon is kind of overkill. Some final thoughts, things that should be discussed. First and foremost, this is a work in progress. It's not 100% finished. 
while I was making this video, a firmware update was automatically downloaded to the machine and all I had to do was print update and it updated itself. It changed the functionality of how the fan speed. That's the only thing that I noticed as far as changes go. But apparently Bamboo Lab is responsive to the wider audience, to their customer base. There was another YouTuber who made a stink about a three minute um, thermal runaway protection time and thought it should be shorter and Bamboo Lab listened and they shortened that. Now there can be consequences for having too short of a thermal runaway window, but hey, this is a glass and aluminum enclosure. Even if there was a fire inside of there, uh, it's not gonna do a lot of damage right away. I think three minutes is plenty of time, but they listened, that's the point. And they changed it because they bowed to popular um, sentiment. <laughs> they, they caved into the mob, if you will, or maybe they really did get that detail wrong. I don't know, I'm not gonna judge. But the point is that Bamboo Labs listens to us and they change things, which is phenomenal. But they don't really need to change all that much because they mostly got it right. How did they get it right? Once again, it's because they curated the best ideas from everywhere that they could find them and they rolled them into one package and then they polished that package to a mirror shine. Just the most polished, amazing product you can think of. And they achieved greatness here by following a technique pioneered by Prusa. So they basically beat Prusa at every level, <laughs> right? They, they just did what Prusa did, but better. The thing is, neither from Prusa nor from Bamboo Lab are we seeing anything truly revolutionary, except the LiDAR, which is amazing. That's, I'm, I just, I love it, it's fantastic. But aside from that, we've seen all these features before. They're just better polished here. So. There are still many things that we need to see, many uh, um, innovations yet to come in FDM 3D printing. For instance, there is still no offering on the market for us to buy a high temperature chamber 3D printer. Something that has an air temperature inside there of like 150, maybe 200 degrees Celsius, that would be crazy, right? But it would allow us to print just below the glass transition temperature of the high performance plastics. We're talking like polycarbonate, maybe even PEK or something like that. Um, even printing ABS, it would eliminate shrinkage and everybody in the Pew Pew community knows what I'm talking about. We wanna be able to print engineered components with very high tolerances at, you know, without getting all the crazy warping and all that stuff. So, uh, hello, <laughs> why aren't you offering that? I think that a team of PhDs in engineering could come up with a solution for the uh, thermal expansion and contracting the heat cycling, they call it. It's, it's a torturous environment to make a 3D printer that can handle that. It's, it's, a, it's a hard um, egg to crack. And I think these guys are up to it. So I look forward to seeing them actually innovate instead of just um, copying what's been done and doing it better. I wanna make it as clear as possible that I have no affiliation with Bamboo Lab. I was lucky enough to get this printer. I hear it's a three month wait at this point. So yeah, I, I don't have anything to do with this company and there's just too many idiots who wanna make this a team sport as if having an orange printer instead of a, a glass and aluminum printer matters to your sense of value as a person. It just, it boggles my brain. This is engineering. These are machines. This is not something that, this, is, this isn't politicians. This isn't like soccer, you know, football if you're in Europe, you know. It shouldn't be this acrimonious. Just go with the best product out there and that's this printer. But this printer is made by a company and that company happens to be Chinese. So I met with the liaison, the Chinese citizen who is currently working in the United States and representing Bamboo Lab and he was a very kind and wonderful person. I had a great time talking to him and uh, everything he said was music to my ears. He said that the company values basically succeeding on their merits, making the best possible product, and they don't wanna get into a mudslinging match or weird politics online. That's not what they wanna do. It was just, everything that they said was incredible. But I have to be a little bit skeptical because I know that Bamboo Lab is a spinoff from DJI. DJI is the drone manufacturer. The Washington Post, I think it was, exposed DJI as being funded by the CCP. So I would not be at all surprised to learn that the funding to make this printer happen also came from the CCP. And there's not any like 
outwardly facing cameras and I don't think there's a microphone on this printer so I'm not too worried about my privacy and the CCP you know using this company to spy on me or something like that but you know it is worrying when you think about the fact that you are not allowed to transfer g-code directly from your computer to the printer you have to go through bamboo labs cloud and that I just don't like it but there's another explanation and that's the fact that bamboo lab lives in China, the den of thieves, where they are absolutely going to have their stuff stolen like that the day that they release it. There's already printers, since I started making this video, that mimic the aesthetic of this printer. So to protect their intellectual property in a country with no functioning patent system, they have a farce of a patent system in China, the only option is a trade secret. And the core value that they're protecting with trade secrets is the g-code that runs the startup algorithm the the, the lidar all that stuff there's g-code that does that kind of thing and they don't want us to see the g-code that's being sent especially because if we could see that g-code then all of the other slicers would be able to make a plug-in for this printer and they would lose their mm, stranglehold on their customer base using just the Bamboo Lab slicer. So money, they want to keep their customers locked into their ecosystem. All of these companies want that. That's the same goal that they all share. So they're not evil in that regard. But what is, mm, how about hypocritical, is the fact that they used open source software to get here. They used ideas that were freely shared on the internet to get here. So they were, sh they were given this tremendous advantage and this leg up. They didn't have to start from zero to develop this phenomenal product. And as soon as they get this phenomenal product, the part that they add to it, they've locked up and they won't share. That is totally a violation of the spirit of open source, as I already talked about. And it's, it's kind of egregious. Understandable because they need to make money. This is capitalism and capitalism is a thing that works. But it's, it's, you know, it just bugs me. It does chafe me. Um, I'm hoping that they will uh, let us see the G-code. Let the other slicers do their thing. Because like I showed, I had problems with the zits forming on, on, the, on, the ex, on the exterior skin when I printed with a random start point. There's all kinds of uh, um, settings that I would like to change. To get rid of those zits, I'd like to do some coasting or some wiping. Or maybe it's just a problem of pressure advance. Uh, I can't really see that as being the case too much. It does have a long melt chamber, but it is direct drive as well. So mm, what is the problem there? I don't know, but I would like to be able to solve it. Why don't you give me the, the tools as an educated user of 3D printers to solve it? Also make a path for people who just want to set it and forget it. They don't want to learn, but provide a way for advanced users to get the most functionality out of it. And they're currently not allowing that to happen. They are following the Apple design um, ideal or whatever you want to call it they're they're just they're, they're they're dumbing their product down so that the large number of users can get the best result out of it and they are absolutely not allowing power users to really get into the nuts and bolts so going forward i can see myself using this machine whenever i need to make a quick print happen or possibly if i come up with some sort of a product and I need a print farm printer and I just want to blow it, these printers, these, these uh, prints out as fast as I can so that I can get them in the mail. I could use it for that as well. But um, I'm still more interested in the RepRap movement and the open source stuff that's out there. Products th that are made by smaller companies like Slice Engineering, like Bontech, like Duet 3D. Um, these things can combine to make a truly fantastic printer. And I think that seeing just how good a printer can be, these other companies are gonna step up and we're gonna see a lot of great polish coming on projects from the smaller companies in the near future. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much to my continuing Patreon supporters. You guys mean the world to me. You're the reason I'm still here making videos. Have a great day. See you in the next one, bye. I'm the YouTube algorithm. You should subscribe to Design Prototype Test. Ring the all bell and become a fiscal supporter by clicking on the links. As your benevolent overlord I'm telling you that it will make your life better. Rather than allowing me to keep force feeding you mass audience, vacuous content, you'll actually be shown the interesting stuff that most people miss.